that straight away. Okay, great. As you know, um, I have uh, read your book uh, about impact and uh, I am um, I admire the work that you've done and uh, that you're still doing. And uh, I'd like to talk to you uh, about the uh, impact revolution, where it's going and how we are going to uh, expand the ideas that you have and um, have as much impact as, as possible. So um, would you start by uh, telling me why you call this uh, a revolution? Sure. Uh, so I call it a revolution because it reminds me a lot of the tech revolution. Um, the tech revolution came in stages. Uh, at first, uh, it was a completely different way of thinking. And a lot of people thought it would be uh, uh, affecting only the computer industry. Uh, you know, the, the invention of the microchip would only affect the computer industry. And then, of course, what we've seen is it affected every single industry from, you know, computing all the way through to retailing. Right, uh, the whole alphabet um, of industries has been uh, has been um, uh, covered, and it fundamentally changes uh, the way in which we do business. Uh, and 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 so I feel the impact revolution is very similar. That if the tech revolution created a layer of water on which every ship must sail today. The impact revolution is creating another layer on top of that, on which every ship is going to have to sail to. Um, we can see uh, entrepreneurship changing. Uh, entrepreneurs are putting impact um, at to the core of their business models. We can see big business changing, with companies beginning to worry about their carbon emissions and, you know, and, you know, and so on. We're seeing companies that are reshaping their supply lines, that are changing their product ranges and, you know, and so on and so forth to be closer uh, in, in, in um, uh, impact um, to the values of, um, of their customers and and their talent. And we're seeing it in investment markets in the biggest way because we have 40 trillion of ESG today. Um, now, we, we never, five years ago, 10 years ago, um, when people talked about ESG, they never thought it could come to the mainstream, that it could actually affect the valuation of companies, how they deal with environmental and social issues. But that's what we're seeing, Carsten, isn't it? And we're seeing shareholder rebellions. But most importantly, we're seeing that the companies that pollute more are worth less, generally speaking, certainly uh, in many, in, in many uh, sectors. So it's transforming the world of investment. It's leading to a rotation of portfolios away from high pollution, high social damage um, uh, sectors. Um, and it's going to lead to a complete a change of uh, approach, in my view, for government as well, because government is going to be focusing on outcomes rather than funding activities. Impact transparency is going to enable government to tax companies more fairly. Um, and, and because um, at the moment, they're taxing every company for the damage being caused by some. Uh, but if you have transparency, then you'll be able to tax the polluters and the employers of child labor and so on and so forth. So it really is transforming uh, almost every aspect um, of, our, of, of our economies. So the, traditionally, when you talk about a revolution, you're also overthrowing a, a government or a system. Is, is that happening as well in this revolution? Yeah, I, I talk of overthrowing the tyranny of profit. Mm -hmm. um, the tyranny of profit has driven us now to economies that create more environmental and social damage than even governments are able to cope with, right? Mm -hmm. And what we're doing by bringing impact to guide the activities of companies and to optimize risk return and impact in the terms of, of, of my book, 
um, by doing that, we're overthrowing the tyranny of profit and putting impact by its side um, to make sure that um, it doesn't lead us to extremes. You mentioned that the tech revolution came in stages, uh, and I presume the impact revolution will do the same. So, so, so where are we on the uh, revolution timeline here? So we started off with a change in values among young people um, 10 or 15 uh, years ago. Investors began to be aware of it. Um, seven years ago, there was about 13 billion of ESG investment. Today, there's 40. Seven years ago, there was virtually no impact investment where you measure the impact created. Today, there's two, two and a half trillion. Um, you know, so that was the first stage, if you like, the stage of of awareness. Uh, and the next stage is the stage of transparency. And we're beginning to see um, the standardization of metrics mm. uh, for measuring impact with the announcement of the ISSB, which I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, at COP26, the uh, International Sustainable Standards Board set up by IFRSF, which um, the organization IFRSF uh, covers all the financial accounting across the world uh, with the exception of, of the United States. So it's a big deal when they begin to standardize impact measurement. It sort of answers the question, are we going to be measuring impact? And the next stage is going to be the valuation of impacts, which means that they will be included in financial analysis mm. much more easily than they can be today when you have tons of one thing and liters of another and percentages of diversity and so on and so forth. And when you begin to have the same unit of measurement, you'll be able to incorporate uh, these numbers uh, in the profit and loss statement of, of a company uh, to work out correlations uh, between its impact and its future growth and profitability, its uh, you know, valuation relative to companies delivering less impact and so on and so forth. So it's another major step. And then I think the step after that will be that government will uh, mandate uh, the publication of impact weighted accounts. Mm. Um, and uh, when when that happens, I think then you, you will really see our economies shift mm. uh, from creating problems to creating solutions. So Does there, are, there are these stages, you can probably break it down into smaller ones, but... Does the revolution have an end goal or is this an ongoing process? I, I think it's going to be an ongoing process because it begins to create new role models like Tesla, uh, you know, for example, uh, that others want to emulate right across the world. And the uh, number of social and environmental issues is obviously massive affecting every single country so i think it's a process like technological innovation like um, uh, venture capital um, you know when i kicked off in venture capital uh, the average size of a fund was two and a half uh, million uh, dollars uh, now we have a seven trillion sector of venture capital and you know and private equity, um, and it's it's become part of the processes of bringing innovation to um, our economies, you know, through business, right? So it's not going away now. Innovation had always existed, but it hadn't uh, really been the preserve of small entrepreneurial companies. It had been the preserve of very big companies. Mm. Um, or it had become the preserve, I guess, uh, when Ford started out at the beginning of the 20th century or 
the end of the 19th, then, um, you know, it, it too was a new entrepreneurial venture. But innovation had become the preserve of the big computer companies and, you know, et cetera. And now there's a process of venture capital funded innovation. I think 20% of market capitalization um, uh, today. I don't know whether it's a market capitalization of the top 100 companies, but an impressive percentage of the top companies is venture capital funded. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So you have been in social innovation and in impact for many years now uh, does this revolution go fast enough for you so i think that it took us 10 years from uh, 2000 to 220 to come up with the concept of measuring impact mm. uh, and somehow tying financial returns to impact and that was the first social impact bond in 2010 if you'd said to me in 2010, the social impact bond will inspire two and a half trillion dollars worth of sustainability linked loans and bonds and, and, you know, and, and, and impact that investment more generally, I would have said that's very good going. The, uh, in the report we wrote, uh, for the GA task force in 2014, we had a chapter called the first trillion. And it seemed then that it would take quite some time to achieve it, but it took seven years only. Mm. So I think the revolution is, is moving very fast now. Mm. And um, it will accelerate in my view. So when you were asking me, where is the you know, the end of, 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 of the revolution. The revolution is a process, but the defining moment of this revolution will be the um, mandatory publication of accounts that include impacts. And I think that's going to happen by 2025. Mm. The way you see it, as far as I understand, uh, the entire revolution starts in investment uh impact investment why here why not everywhere else because it involves all aspects of society so it didn't really start with investment it started with consumers with young consumers and young talent and the implication of their changing preferences wasn't lost on investors investors were the second stage mm. of the but if you think about it Carsten. If this revolution is reshaping capitalism, then it's natural that it is going to be a revolution through capital, mm. right? Mm. So the flows of capital are what affect our companies, the behavior of our companies, and the flows of capital and the behavior of our companies are what affect our economies. And so in a way you could say, it started with consumers and talent, it shifted to investors, and it is still to come to big businesses. Mm, mm. See, when, when I look at the, um, at the market here in Denmark, I see uh, a paradox. I see uh, more and more startups and early stage businesses involved in impact looking for capital. And then I see uh, big investors saying we can't find the companies to invest in. So it seems to me like there's an ecosystem that has to be built. Yeah. What is, what is missing at the moment is the intermediation. Uh, the intermediation is the fund managers, basically. Mm. And so in the absence of funds that can attract significant money, institutional investors aren't going to participate. And so they don't see the deal flow uh, because they are too big to be looking at very small deals. Mm. But what you're beginning to see now is a number of different organizations getting into ESG and impact investing. So you see the Blackrocks and the Vanguards and almost every 
investment management organization doing it in public markets, mm. um, in equities, in bonds, as, as, as we were saying, uh, and so on. Within the private asset classes, the private equity industry led. So you had funds like TPG and KKR and Bain and Blackstone and Partners Capital and Apex and EQT uh, in your part of um, in your part of the world and Summa in your part of the world uh, and um, Bridges Ventures and Leapfrog. You ha you had these funds that came in and said, we're going to optimize risk return impact and we're going to deliver, most of them are delivering market rates of return. Uh, and, and this intermediation has to grow significantly. Mm. Um, but it is growing. Mm. It is growing quite fast, pushed by the pressures on the investors, whether they be public funds, and you have several in Denmark, which feel the pressures, the political pressures, but also the pressures of their savers. So pension savers are concerned about the environment today. They don't want their pensions to go to fossil fuel companies, for example. Uh, so you've seen that pressure on, on investment um, uh, managers. You're seeing it on the asset management industry uh, with huge flows of capital into mutual funds and indices and, um, you know, and, and, and so on. And it's coming now to the private markets. Mm. Um, now, what usually, I don't know if this is too much detail, but what usually happens in, in the early stages of a new way of investing is that the big investors don't have a category for it. So if you go in today to a big pension fund and say, I'm launching an impact private equity fund, they said, oh, we have a private equity category, but we don't have an impact private equity category. We don't know what returns you're going to achieve. Let's wait and see how the market develops before we make an allocation to it. So what usually happens is you get some leaders in the investment business. So in the venture capital industry in the early days, it was the AT&T pension fund, for instance, who said, we can't prove this is going to work, but we have faith this is going to work. And they put a ton of money into it. Mm -hmm. And with time, they became, they became perceived as a smart money. And every other pension fund in the telecoms industry and elsewhere said, well, if AT&T are doing this, we should be, you know, we should be doing it. And then it gathers momentum. That's what's beginning, what's beginning to happen now. So you see very savvy investment groups like Tomasic in Singapore um, allocating $500 million to the leapfrog funds, impact funds. You know? So you begin to see some leaders emerging. Mm. So does that mean that we should simply uh, wait and see, or do you, would you like someone to take more initiative for instance, philanthropy? So government has a big role to play. Mm -hmm. I'll come to philanthropy, but government has a big role to play in messaging. In the early days of the venture capital industry, um, government was crucial uh, because the venture capital was viewed as a rather crazy, risky activity. Entrepreneurship was viewed as very risky. Uh, you know, if you fail, you've destroyed your career type of thing. Mm. And government sent messaging uh, and provided incentives through stock options, through um, uh, tax incentives for venture capital funds and so on and so forth. We need that. Mm. Where yeah. philanthropy is really important is in, in two different places. One, is in the development of the whole system. So if we're going to develop new ways of valuing the impacts of companies, you need philanthropic funding to do that. Mm. Uh, if you're going to spread this internationally, you need to fund organizations that, that are usually philanthropic, spreading it in, you know, internationally. If you're going to address the issue of education, 
and you want to attract funding, you may need blended finance, which is enhanced by a layer of philanthropic money that doesn't get a return. So philanthropy has a big role to play at a systemic level. And actually, um, it, it's quite interesting that there are relatively few foundations interested to play at a systemic level. Most foundations are playing at an issue level. Yes. So there's a big need. And if there are foundations in Denmark um, that uh, think in this, in, in this way, please point them uh, my way. And then the second one is by using their philanthropy to attract more capital. So if you're setting up outcomes funds uh, for education or for migration or uh, you know, for whatever else, um, slums, uh, rehabilitation of slums, setting up philanthropic funds that will pay when results have been achieved, enabling therefore the organizations doing the work to raise investment money like a, a social impact bond, philanthropy is crucial to achieving that. Mm. The impact okay. revolution is coming to philanthropy, but it's at its first stage, which is to shift awareness from activities to outcomes mm -hmm. and to shift thinking to measuring outcomes, not just getting nice reports at the end of the year and, you know, but real uh, and measuring. Steering, steering by intuition and superficial information, basically. I was very interested in the chapter in your book about uh, philanthropy because in, as, in, as it is in Denmark at the moment, uh, the foundations are mainly um, looking at their grant making and they're not unlocking the, their fortunes, uh, their investment fortunes. How do you look upon that? So there has been, and I served on some very big um, philanthropic foundations, there has been a rigid separation for a century mm. between the endowment, which is supposed to make the maximum amount of money in any way it can, mm. and the grant program, which is supposed to be tackling social issues or environmental issues. And it was impossible to break the barrier down between the two, it had been established for so long, but now the pressures on the university endowments from students and faculty and so on, uh, the changing values around us, uh, the changing values um, of the investment management industry, uh, a leading uh, philanthropic foundations in that direction. The fourth foundation was the leader in, in allocating a billion dollars from its endowment um, to uh, ESG and impact investment. Um, others are following, but it, it still hasn't gathered the momentum um, that it should. But things happen asymptotically in the financial world. Mm. It takes a while to establish a track record of doing things, and then it spreads very quickly. And I think we're in the beginning of this asymptote now, where people like the Ford Foundation and others are saying, well, this is, this is how it should be done. And when others observe it, then, you know, they will copy it quite quickly in my view. I'd like to return to uh, how you see the market for uh, impact investment, because you mentioned that uh, the development had, got, had, had gone faster than when you created the social impact bond back in 2010. But what if you look at uh, investments in uh, companies, are there enough success stories, meaning companies that both do well financially and, uh, and, and uh, impact wise? So you can see a new generation of ventures now, mm. which are measuring their impacts and trying to bring solutions. So a software company, which is dealing with the management of public transport, previously would have me measured its profit and its sales. Mm. But today, 
it's it should be me measuring. I mean, one that I'm involved with is measuring the reduction in commuting time, which is more vulnerable populations. Uh, the reduction in CO2 emissions from better scheduling, matching of size of vehicle to the demand and so on and so forth. The reduction in the number of hours a driver is driving a day. The reduction in the number of accident scores. And you, of course, are getting new business models in telemedicine, in, 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 in tele-education. You're beginning to see business models where the student pays for their education, their tertiary education, their college education, or their training as a, as a, a computer coder, mm -hmm. a software writer, um, after they have completed it and got into a job and paying it out of a salary. So you're seeing new business models coming. Now, have they disrupted in the way that the tech revolution disrupted every area? Today, you'd say they've disrupted in, in the aut automobile industry, right? Mm -hmm. So Tesla is probably the best example of optimizing risk, return, and impact mm. um, uh, in, in the automobile industry. But we haven't yet got the Microsofts and the Apples and, and others in education, in health, and a bit are coming. Mm. So basically, you can't really estimate how this is going by looking backwards. You have to say that this is a, such a huge transition that we are in the middle of, and it will change when you look forward. Well, I think it's like planting a field. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you look at the field, and it doesn't show very much change, but you, there are millions of seeds uh, in it. And these millions of seeds are being planted. Uh, and so within the next three Yes, uh, you will begin to see the emergence of new models that are optimizing um, you know, risk return and, and impact. Within 10 years, you, you will have some, you know, it took 20 years for Amazon to get to where it is today. Um, it, you know, it'll take 10 years before we begin to see the Amazons of impact emerging. Uh, at that sort of, of scale, but they will be visible before and they'll be attracting uh, money before. Uh, ma many um, tech companies today are seeking to address solutions as well as make money. So uh, a, a crucial element in this impact revolution, that's the, the measuring and finding the right metrics um, where would you say that we are? Which stage are we at the moment? I think, I think we're at the stage where we have a pretty good handle on the physical metrics, CO2 tons, liters of water or effluent, etc. And we are at the... Um, completion of the framework stage for the valuation of impacts. Mm. So there's an effort at Harvard Business School, and there's an effort um, in, in Europe led by the Value Balancing Alliance, um, which have now developed frameworks for measuring impacts of companies, their impact from their operations, impact from their employment, impact from their products on people and the environment, translating it into dollar terms, and actually publishing thousands of companies' impacts. So the conceptual, and the, more than the conceptual framework, I mean, the implementation has already begun, and, and I think it's going to accelerate uh, quickly over the next two to three years. So I would expect that three years from now, we will be in a position to turn the metrics into monetary values mm. and to include impacts in financial accounting. 
When I speak to people, uh, I always hear that, oh, it's so difficult to measure impact, uh, particularly uh, social impact. But what you say in your book is that, well, it might be difficult, but it's not nearly as difficult as it was finding the right metrics for uh, measuring risk. Correct. Correct. And, and we're showing that. So, for instance, when you think of measuring diversity, if you haven't given it much a thought, it, it seems immeasurable. But when you begin to address it, as we've done at uh, Harvard, you begin to think, well, the cost to a community of not having somebody from that community in employment is the salary of that person. So if we compare the demographics inside a company's factories and outside, we can calculate the missing number of people, and we have the ability to put salary levels against it. And so we can look at a company like Apple and say it pays $10 billion in wages. It has a $2 billion diversity debit. It actually uh, does not have sufficient numbers of people from ethnic and gender and other you know, minorities. Or it doesn't have, I mean, gender is not a minority because there are probably <laughs> as many or more women than men, uh, but uh, from, from uh, different gender groups. Uh, and, and, and so you can begin to say, wow, well, Apple is still doing better than Intel, which is much smaller and also has a $2 billion debit. But it's doing less well than Costco, which has a billion dollar debit. So you can begin. You can begin to get insights um, that uh, you superficially wouldn't have anticipated. Mm. So, so why is it that I keep hearing that it's so difficult to measure social impact? Is that because people in the sector still are not aware of what's possible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're just not aware yet. So, uh, so, so, what what can be done about that? Sharing knowledge. Well, the first thing that can be done is to get companies to begin to use it, and there are fifty to a hundred companies across the world now that are beginning to measure their impacts and turn them into uh, into monetary values, which is you know the second step, as we were saying. So you take a French company like Michelin, uh, it's measuring its carbon emissions and it's using a hundred dollars a ton um, to value them. And if you speak to the finance uh, director of Michelin, I had the occasion to be on a uh, webinar with him recently. He said, look, once you put a monetary value on these things, your management team begins to relate to it differently. Like you, be, you begin to compare it with profit. It's a, a currency is something that we can all understand and uh, you know and, and 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 use. So, I think the next step is, is it, I think this will interest you, Carsten. I think the next step is that the data that's being generated is going to be increasingly used. You can already see that it's price sensitive in terms of stock prices. Mm -hmm. The companies that pollute more are worth less. And that means that regulators are going to have to step in. The pressure to set up the ISSB came from EOSCO, which groups the world's regulators. Mm. We need transparency, which means comparable, verified, it's a consistent data so that every investor is in the same position to make a decision. Mm, mm. And so as the data begins to circulate, you create a disorderly market. And the more data circulates, the greater the pressure. Mm. So I think that's the mechanism of this uh, revolution. And that's why I say it won't be more than three years, three, four years from now. Mm. By 2025, in my view, we will have mandatory impact accounting.
When I look at the new regulation that's on the way from uh, the EU and, and uh, see the response from, from mainly the big corporations in Denmark, they're very critical. There's a lot of resistance. Um, in your book, you're uh, endorsing the B Corp move, movement, but they're really uh, having a lot of resistance here in, in, in Denmark. What do people from uh, big business say when you say these things to them? But big business generally does not want transparency on impact because it's, an, it's a different way of measuring their performance. It's not the way they've been running their business to achieve performance in this. So many of them are going to be found lacking. Mm -hmm. uh, you see it already in the environmental data at Harvard, 3,000 companies impact, 450 companies create more damage than profit in a year. Mm -hmm. A thousand create damage equivalent to 25% or more of their profit. So you know that it's going to lead to criticism of company performance on, on the impact front. The ones who are in favor of it in big business are the ones who have realized, like the arrival of technology, this is unstoppable now, and you have to get ahead of it. Mm. So you take a company like BP, it's, uh, it's in, you saw it in the book, its environmental damage is about 30 billion compared with 39 billion for ExxonMobil. Mm -hmm. So they put themselves ahead of the curve uh, and, and Shell is in between the two at about 23. And so they're investing in clean energy, they're trying to reduce their carbon footprints and, you know, and so on and so forth. So you will have a minority of companies going for this, just as you had a minority of companies embracing technology. Mm. The status quo is hard to shift, but the pressures from shareholders are going to accelerate the process. So when ExxonMobil has to kick out three shareholders, uh, three directors from its board and the point three that it didn't want, you know something's changed. When the shareholders of Procter & Gamble uh, demand that management provides information about deforestation uh, as a result of its use of palm oil, you know that things are changing. Mm. And you will have, I don't know, a couple of hundred or more resolutions on environmental and social issues um, you know, at shareholder meetings of companies that aren't performing well in these respects. So that will accelerate uh, the process. Do you ever have uh, moments of doubt where you think, oh, maybe this resistance will stop the revolution? I think it's unstoppable um, because it's our economic system that's creating the climate crisis and the social inequalities that are putting so much pressure on the cohesion of our societies. Um, and those aren't going to go away. And there isn't another way of dealing with them uh, than to change the, you know, the uh, effect of our economic system to bring solutions rather than problems. So the longer we delay it, the greater the negative consequences, the greater the pressure to get there. Mm. So for me, it's, un it's unstoppable. I'd like how, to do ask you you... Oh, how, how do you see it? How do you see it? Well, I, I see it the same way, but sometimes, particularly when I read about the resi resistance from such big companies in, in, in Denmark against the new EU legislation, um, Sometimes I worry that they might, well, at least slow down uh, this revolution. Yeah. Well, you're going to have companies on one side, consumers, talent and investors on the other, mm. and governments in between. Mm. And the question is, which of these forces in the end will prevail? I think, uh, I think investors, consumers and talent 
will change the behavior of companies, not the other way around. How do you view the governments? Because I mean, they, they don't seem, at least here in Denmark, where of course we have a very big welfare state, um, the government doesn't seem that proactive, to put it mildly. I think governments are waiting to see what happens. They're not anxious to lead an effort which is going to bring them in conflict with companies that don't want to see this happen. You know? Mm. So governments are, are waiting to see. They don't fully understand yet that, that this is a way to achieve their social and environmental objectives that they need it in order to achieve them. Mm. But they will. Mm. They will, as you know, more and more is written. For instance, have you seen the G7 Impact Task Force report or not yet? It came I, have, out. I haven't seen it yet. Please go online and, and, and find it. Otherwise, I'll be very happy to send you the link to it. A G7 Impact Task Force. Mm -hmm. It's a 40-page report, but there's a lot of other documentation behind it that's been published. 120 people were involved in the work. The head of Standard & Poor's led the um, working group on impact transparency and integrity. The CEO of NL was on it, Emmanuel Faber of Danone, who's now going to be chair of the ISSB, was on it, and so on and so forth. So, very serious group of people. Uh, nobody can argue otherwise. And it basically, it, the title is Time to Deliver. Mm, yeah. so governments aren't all going to deliver at the same time, as you and I know. When GAP was introduced, the US government led the world in 1933 and 34. It took a few years for the rest of the world to follow. People said it's, it's impossible to have the same set of principles for every company irrespective of size and, and sector. Uh, and if it is possible, it's going to spell the end of American capitalism. Well, you know, looking back, it was a necessary step for us to have the financial markets we have now. And I think governments are going to find themselves in the same situation. Some governments are going to take the lead. It could be the EU. It could be the Biden administration. It could be the UK or New Zealand or Canada. I mean, there, there are countries, it could be the Netherlands. There are countries that are on the you know, on the theme now mm. in a big way. Um, so it could be a small country, but today you'd have to say it's the EU or the Biden administration that are likely to set, mm. to set the pace. Um, Ronnie, I'd also like to ask you about civil society because at least here in uh, in Denmark, uh, civil society is is rather undervalued, in my opinion. They're not really taken into account when new legislation is made, and you know, in business, they're seen like uh, they're seen as naive or you know just uh, firebrands. And uh, what is your uh, view on civil society? But for, for me. This impact revolution is putting civil society in a similar position to business in terms of raising money. Mm. Civil society has lived on grants, government grants, philanthropic grants, mostly. Mm. And it's very distressing to see that this grant model has led to civil society organizations being small and out of money, with very few exceptions. And when you read the chapter on philanthropy, you realize that the, 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 the reason for this is that nothing was measured. You could never have conviction mm -hmm. that uh, uh, money that you had given away in grants had actually achieved an, an objective. And in the absence of that conviction and given huge demands for philanthropic funding, it was natural for everybody to be a philanthropic nomad. You give money for three years here and you give money for three years there and, you know, and so on and so forth. 
what the impact revolution uh, has done, and it really started with the challenges of civil society, with you know the effort over 10 years to develop the social impact bond, mm. it connected social entrepreneurs to the capital markets, except that civil society hasn't grabbed it with both hands yet. Why? Yeah. Civil society also is wary about transparency. Mm -hmm. Civil society has not been accountable for its performance. The beneficiaries are the people to whom it is accountable. The trustees have given the money away of the foundation, have given the money away, and they receive a report back with no real performance measurement. Mm -hmm. and, and as that changes, you can expect civil society to become a lot more effective at scaling up, raising capital to scale up. That a civil society organization came to see me a, a, a few years ago, and they were helping in the UK about 7,000 people a year. I said to me, what is, they asked me, what is the change that this impact revolution is bringing to us? And I said, the change is, you can ask yourself the question now, I'm helping 7,000 people, how many would I like to help? Mm. How many are there in the UK who are homeless? You know, is it uh, 60,000, 100,000, 200,000? Of those, how many would I like to help? And how do I gear myself up as an organization to do it? Well, now you can raise money to do that. You can say, I'm helping seven. Within three years, I want to help 15. And within six years, I want to help 30. And at the end of the decade, I want to be helping 60 or 70,000. Mm. And you can raise money for it. That mechanism is, has begun. So big society capital, which I'm very proud to have been involved in, in establishing, big society capital has attracted about $3 billion pounds, 3 billion pounds to civil society organizations in the UK. But status quos are difficult to shift and civil society is no exception. Yes, because uh, I mean, this could be seen as a gift to civil society, which it probably is. But I see a lot of resistance in civil society. They find it difficult, probably also because they have to struggle on a daily basis to get the next uh, little amount for, for their uh, operations. So they find it very difficult to enter this new field. Yeah, I think um, transitioning from one model to another is always... Uh you know, a delicate, a delicate thing. And uh, if uh, your survival depends on raising the next small grant, you know, that's what you yeah. will, you will do. Yeah. Sometimes you're so busy finding oh, wow. the little amount of money that you can't really look for the big amount. Yeah. You know, there was a very funny story when I was at Oxford about um, a Don, a, a, an academic fellow who would drink a bit too much, and at night, he would cross the quad, and there was one tree in the quad only, and he'd bump into it <laughs> and fall down, and the student ran up to help him, and he bumped into it a second time, and he heard him say, lost, lost in the bloody forest. <laughs> 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 and I think, I think, in a way, when you're just obsessed with that one grant, you're lost in that forest. Mm. You're lost in that forest, which is a solitary tree mm. uh, that you keep bumping into, getting up and bumping into again. Mm. But it, like everything, the supply of capital creates its own demand. Mm. And the new generation of social society leaders is growing up now with the consciousness that they can raise capital. And so it's natural that the one day <laughs> some of them will say, well, the, the way we've been doing things just doesn't make any sense at all, mm -hmm. which is why I was so keen to establish outcomes funds at scale, you know, which we're doing <clears throat> with the Education Outcomes Fund. Mm -hmm. 
because it then transforms, it just transforms completely the ecosystem for a civil society organization working on education in Africa. All of a sudden, it can sign a contract for $30 million to help 300,000 kids, raise $22 million from a fund set up by UBS and Bridges Ventures, and innovate in every way it can to achieve the objective and get paid. And if it pays 4 or 5% on its bond or more, it can go back and raise twice as much uh, you know, the next round. Mm. So I agree with you uh, that the civil society hasn't fully absorbed all of the implications uh, for its mission mm. of being able to use capital. But it will come. I was very conscious as we were building the venture capital industry that it took time and track record to change perceptions. Mm. So the first European fund, the VAPAX, in 1981 was 10 million. 20 years later, they were $5 billion funds. And 10 years after that, they were $11 billion funds. So in 30 years, we went from 10 million to 11 billion, mm. right? But the growth wasn't like that from the beginning. Exactly, yeah. You know? So you, the first fund was 10 million, the next one was 30, three years later, then 75 then 190, then 1.8 billion, then 5 billion. Mm. So I've had discussions with people about how quickly these things happen. And I have always said they happen much faster than you expect. Mm. And today, you look at the social impact bond market, and it's a market of about 210 bonds, about $500 million in, in capital invested, so probably more than a billion in, in outcomes in 35 countries. And you could say, well, in 11 years, that isn't amazing growth. But then you're surprised by sustainability linked bonds and loans which are now a billion, a trillion, mm -hmm. a trillion. The idea of pay for success for civil society organizations achieved 500 million, but the business world took it and turned it into a trillion. Mm -hmm. So, and then the influence of the business world on civil society, when civil society looks at this and says, wow, companies are borrowing money through bonds their interest rate falls if they achieve a social objective, which could be that their pharmaceutical products go to more vulnerable populations. I am charged with a mission to help these same populations, and I'm doing it <laughs> with pocket money, mm -hmm. sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's bound to affect the thing. Anyway, it's just a way, it's just a way of saying that ideas and mechanisms spread much faster than you know than most of us expect mm -hmm. is there actually a risk that civil society organizations will become unnecessary if this goes uh, if if business takes on this this task no no no, no. because social society organizations are impact driven. Mm -hmm. And there are always vulnerable groups in need of help. No economic system can deal fairly with every, you know, with every category of, of, of society. Mm -hmm. So we can hope that we can improve certain social issues, differences in pay, better diversity, and so on. But there will still be these uh, eternal issues that uh, talent is spread 
universally, but opportunity isn't. Mm. And you have to help people connect with opportunity to improve their lives. So, no, I have no fear. What I, I do think is that the, these approaches that we're talking about will be used where you can measure. Mm. And traditional philanthropy will continue to give grants where things can't be measured. So when you're trying to measure human rights, mm. when you're trying to measure freedom of the press, when you're trying to measure very often uh, mental well-being, when you're helping people at uh, the end of their lives who are terminally ill, mm. uh, measurements are uh, not really going to be the way to drive activity. Mm. So there are time. limits to measuring. Yeah. Mm. I think I've been through uh, what I had in mind. Is there something so, that you think should be mentioned? No, I'd be curious to hear from you in the next uh, minute. How do you see Denmark evolving? Because Denmark has a lot of the values that you would expect to have uh, for uh, embracing this. So in the environmental movement has been very strong in them. So how do you see Denmark evolving? I see this, uh, I see a very big interest for this, particularly uh, among foundations and um, among young people coming out of uh, universities, uh, building impact startups um, and also among uh, investors. Um, I see government lagging behind uh, because our uh, social democratic government is very keen on having uh, the state the government uh, take care of all social welfare. Um, they are trying to avoid uh, businesses making money on social uh, services. So I see some resistance uh, from the government and I see some resistance from, uh, from big business, but I see a huge interest from uh, a variety of groups in society. So I think this is going to take on now and, and uh, with a lot more speed over the next couple of years, but I see some, some bumps on the way. About to be passed. Mm. Okay, well, thank you very much, Carsten. Lovely to meet you. And thank and you very you, much. What are you going to do with this? Are you going to publish something or is it? A... I am definitely going to publish. Um, okay. I think probably split it up into uh, several articles with one uh, big interview with you. Um, I may want to publish it in English as well. Um, if you don't mind, and um, spread it uh, as much as possible. Very good, Well, That would be very helpful to the movement. Excellent. Thank you. And Thank I'll, you I, will, I will, of course, send it uh, to Samantha so that you can have a look at it and uh, make sure that I've uh, got everything right. Okay. Thank you so much. Love, nice to meet you. Good nice luck. to meet you too. Bye. Bye-bye.